Aloha. It's March the 2nd, 2022. It's Wednesday, it's 11 o'clock. That can mean only one thing. Time for What Now America? I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. Today's title is Biden's State of the Union. Much to report. This was uh, President Biden's first State of the Union address. And we're gonna discuss that with my esteemed guests, Jay Fidel, Karen Buzzard, and Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Winston Welch is out on assignment. So uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Tim. Morning. Let's get to it. Jay, straight to you. Um, President Biden's State of the Union address. Did he have success of trying to unite the polarized GOP from the Democrats during his speech? And if so, to what degree was he successful or not successful? Hmm. Hmm. I don't, I don't think he had much effect on the GOP. A lot of them didn't come. And some of them came and rolled their eyes. I like when they do that. Um, you know, where, where it's been a bill they're never, ever, ever going to vote for, the Republicans, uh, in the Senate especially, they're never going to vote for them. And so what do they do? They roll their eyes. And um, our media caught that. So we had a number of eye roll shots there. Um, so I I think, uh, on the other hand, he wasn't really talking to them. He was talking to the public. He was talking to the country. He was talking to the world. He was talking to Europe, for sure. He was talking to Ukraine. He was talking to Putin. Uh, and, and that was um, you know, appropriate. And uh, that was a success in terms of uniting. Well, did, you know, I, did I watch a different State of the Union? I, I could have sworn I saw all the GOPs rise enthusiastically and clap quite, quite enthusiastically to uh, his address about Ukraine. Oh yeah, I'm getting to that. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. The, the most the most successful part of the speech was the first 15 minutes, maybe, where he focused on Ukraine, and that was really well done. Uh, and you could see uh, there were standing ovations on pretty much everything he said. That was was good. It's good to bring the Ukrainian ambassador there. There, that was good. And you know what he said was was uniting. It was uniting for the country because most right thinking people, I mean, most right thinking people are are um, in favor of his policies on Ukraine. And of course, Europe was impressed. I, I talked to a, a European uh, show this morning, and uh, they were they were impressed. Um, Putin was watching it, I'm sure, although some say he doesn't watch television. I don't believe that. Uh, so uh, all in all, that was the, the mark of success for the, for the uh, speech. I thought there were some other things, though, that were not particularly successful. On the other hand, you know, you got to do it. For example, my reaction was, gee, all these points, some of them failed initiatives uh, on and on. You know, a lot of little points uh, about a lot of little issues, uh, issues that, you know, really are embarrassing in terms of the results so far. And yet <clears throat> I mentioned this to my walking buddy this morning and he said, no, no, you, you have to cover everything. This is a state of the union. It's good, bad and otherwise. Um, and you have to cover things because if you don't cover things, then somebody says, how come he didn't cover that? So we had to. Um, so all in all, I would say it was positive. All in all, I would say it was it was uh, it made my heart pound uh, there at the beginning with Ukraine. Uh, some of the other parts did not make my heart pound, but uh, he was doing the responsible thing. Um, he was addressing the issues. He had good advisors. Uh, he had good points to make. I'm not sure that it changes the world. OK, well, that's the second part of my question, and that is, you know, if Winston was at the table right now, I'm sure I'd hear, you know, optimism of politics. And that's the question. Did his address about Ukraine and the 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 matter that it is unifying um, both sides of the aisle? Is that an entree for other issues that possibly uh, the GOP can rally around? Uh, yeah, it could, later it could in be. the address, uh, yeah. Joe Biden thought there was. Yeah, no, it, I, I definitely could be. I mean, we, we got to start somewhere, you know, pinning the blanket down, so to speak. You, you do one corner, then you do the other. And this was definitely a corner to do. And it was a corner, a corner that may have, um, you know, salient effect on, on other issues, at least some of them, at least some of them anyway. Um, I guess, um, you know, I was, I was impressed with that. I was touched with that. I was touched what he said. I was, I was touched with the fact that America seems to be united in this matter. 
Um, and although a few um, you know ridiculous remarks by Trump and his friends, uh, most most right thinking people are uh, com in complete support. So yes, I think it was it was positive um, for Biden, for America, uh, and for that matter for the Congress. Uh, whether it has a big effect on things, I don't know because you know Putin has the, has the stage today. Putin's giving his uh, state of the Eastern Europe. Uh, today, and he's relentlessly heading on down to Kiev, and um, he's going to do a lot of destruction today. Um, it's it's not you know clear whether all the negative reaction he's getting makes a difference for him. Uh, and a lot of people, a lot of commentators, despite uh, you know the optimism that Biden showed last night, um, are worried about a, a larger conflagration in Europe, including, as I mentioned, I talked to a European this morning. Um, Europe is afraid of a larger conflagration. Europe is afraid of World War III now. Um, and, and then they have you know, reason, reason to be afraid. Uh, and, and we need to be aware of that. So um, you know, the sanctions are a good idea. His view of it, his expression of it in the speech, uh, his um, summary of how th the sanctions are having a, a significant effect on Russia, all that is good. But whether you know, the city on the hill will remain in a leadership position, whether the EU and NATO will stay close together. Um, these are questions that are not answered. And, you know, in a week or two, we'll find out more. And his speech will be only one of many things that affect public and international opinion on that. All right. Thank you, Jay. Karen, to you, you know, Jay just mentioned something, questions that are not answered. And the question is, did Joe Biden really connect the dots to the American public of what they might expect as far as consequences as a result of this Ukraine-Russia conflict? Did he, did he prepare the audience well enough to say, you should be expecting, for example, higher gas prices or, or, or results of um, inflation in other areas that we didn't, couldn't imagine? Um, how do you think Joe Biden did with prepping the United States uh, audience to some of the fallout of this conflict? Well, I think he did uh, mention uh, that there could be higher inflation and uh, gasoline prices as a result of the conflict. So, I mean, he didn't go into great depth, but he did mention it in passing. But I have to say that, you know, I think this speech, he's at a critical point in his presidency. He only has something like 57% approval ratings. And I think this speech showed uh, people why we elected him to begin with, which was civility, uh, particularly as it was highlighted against Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Bobart, who decided to uh, kind of heckle him during his part in the speech where he mentioned his son uh, having died related to a war injury. And she yeah. were heavily booed, which was interesting because in the past, uh, I don't think they were booed before. There were several rallies in the speech by the, I think the immigration policy, when he mentioned that the Republicans stood up, uh, when he mentioned um, the police, uh, fund the police, they all stood up. So there were kind of other points of agreement in the speech you could see with the Republicans. Uh, I didn't expect that, you know, it's become the norm that they don't really stand up for most uh, points. But I used to, interestingly enough, in a former life, teach public speaking. And I would give this speech an A because I think he did an excellent job of rallying, rallying the troops, and as it were. And going into the speech, I was like, oh, no, I have to listen to this because, you know, I felt really kind of depressed about the country and I wasn't looking forward to hearing it. And when I came out, I was very, very impressed. I, you know, I think he really lifted the spirits and it made me believe that he should be more in the public limelight. I think he kind of um, decided to get out of the limelight because of the me tooism of Trump, you know, Trump, me, 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 me. And so he thought he would, you know, kind of stay out of the limelight more. But I think this speech showed that, you know, he can do an excellent job if he is kind of presented. He's kind of been sidelined a lot by, um, groups that he has tried to put forward. So I think um, overall it was an excellent speech. And I think the second part was also very good because I was very impressed. I didn't really expect any kind of depth in his talking points because of the time, 
but he did seem to hit all the key points. The only point that I came away thinking he didn't address was climate change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, let's take a little um, moonwalk back in history when Barack Obama was giving the State of the Union speech. And I forget the, the congressman's name where he said, you lie. And if you recall, um, you know, for a week, uh, that, that topic or that outburst uh, was received both by the GOP and Democrats. And this, this particular representative was severely treated, um, you know, harshly, almost to the point of being censored. But it, that didn't happen. Do um, you expect anything or any out, um, any out, you know, fallout from um, Marjorie Taylor Greene's outbursts? Well, I think she's already been pretty marginalized <laughs> as it is. She's been taken off all her committees, uh, except for not being reelected. I'm not sure what else they can do to her. But I did see a comment by uh, one of the other Congress people that said that she didn't. Um, she wasn't in the same human race as the rest of us, which I thought was a pretty damning comment. <laughs> well, and um, um, Mitt Romney's comment about, I have morons on my team yeah, after right. CPAC uh, took place this weekend. Um, yeah. that, was, that was quite a telling remark. <laughs> right, it was. Um, a friend of mine said this would have been an opportunity for Joe Biden to uh, call out those uh, Pompeo and Trump as labeling Putin a genius and uh, a really shrewd, smart guy and, and really very unpatriotic um, comments. Was this the opportunity for Joe Biden to do that or, or did he, does he always take the high road? Well, uh, having taught public speaking, this is called a ceremonial speech and the focus of a ceremonial speech is positive. You never hit the negative in a ceremony. You know, you're the, the goal is to uplift, to make people feel good. So it's uh, not the time to bring up uh, disagreements or points of uh, negative points. So in that sense, I don't think this would have been appropriate in this speech. Okay, good points. All right, thank you, Karen. Uh, Cynthia, to you, um, Joe Biden, mentioned uh, some sanctions against Russia's, certainly um, prohibition of uh, Russian air, airplanes in uh, US airspace. Uh, he really didn't mention a whole lot about the SWIFT banking uh, prohibition. Uh, do you have any thoughts about the sanctions that have been placed thus far and Joe Biden's um, ability or inability to highlight them during the uh, State of the Union speech? I think he did. I, you know, he talked about the financial um, without getting specific about every single one of them, he talked about the financial sanctions that are going to be devastating to Russia. And he went into some good detail about how it was going to affect Russia and even Russian citizens. And, and I think he even made the point that, you know, it's not our goal to hurt Russian people. You know, we just got to make this stop. I can't remember exactly how he said it, but, you know, Something that struck me in the middle of the speech when he, um, you know, put attention to Merrick Garland and said that the Justice Department is now starting a new task force to investigate um, people that have misused COVID funds. And then afterwards, the person who gave the Republican response was Iowa governor. Um, and I can't remember her name, shoot. But at any rate, she's been, she's been audited for misuse of COVID funds. <laughs> she had to repay $450,000 because she used it just to pay staff and you know other miscellaneous things. And I thought, wow, you know, you can't, you can't even, you know, try, try to write that stuff. It just happened. And I thought, oh, my gosh, how many people noticed that? And I, <laughs> I didn't. Thank you for bringing it up. I did not catch that. <laughs> when, another thing that I loved was when he was talking about, when he was kind of touting some of the things that he has done, like the, the you know, the rescue plan, right? And, and, and the, um, you know, the, the bipartisan infrastructure. And that was a big thing, you know, everybody stood up and, and that was a great thing. And then he, he looks over and he looks straight at the Republicans when he said, and some of you have already been touting these things back in your home states. <laughs> and I thought, oh, subtle, I love it. 
<laughs> well, okay. Uh, you got me on that. It almost got me to shed a tear on that. Um, let me ask you this. He did mention a chief prosecutor. Um, isn't that really in the backyard of uh, the, the Justice Department uh, to, to investigate fraudulent or and or um, gouging as a result of COVID-19? Uh, where do you think that came from? I think he's going after price gougers because there's been so much complaint about it. And I also think that- part Was Marilyn Garland on, uh, on board with that? I mean well, he would have to be in order for it to happen, right? I would hope so. So um, I know that, I think anyway, I don't know, I should say, I think. I think that part of the reason we have some of these high prices right now, it's not exactly inflation, it's corporate America trying to make a buck again off of American people. And they see the opportunity to raise these prices with all kinds of excuses and blame it on inflation. I blame it on corporate greed myself because the, at the time when the, the gas prices, just to, to say, um, were going off the charts up, the barrel, the price of a barrel didn't really go up. So where did they justify that raise in the price? And, and I liked that um, Biden said he was releasing, what was it, 60 some odd, can't remember. 60 million the barrels. Million, thank you. Um, barrels of, of reserve to help try to bring some of these prices down. I don't think it's going to work because he's got to get through to corporate America first. And you know, the oil and gas guys, they're all multi billionaires trying to become trillionaires. And so I don't know how much effect he might have, but I'm glad that he's at least looking at it and, and trying to go after it. Well, I mean, that's the number one thing he's taking hits on as far as criticism, and that is the rising price of gas. So um, 60 million, I hate to say it, seems like a drop in the uh, barrel. Doesn't yeah. seem like much. Uh, right. Should he have gone for more or uh, more cooperation from other countries to increase supply, particularly from the Middle East? Uh, right. I didn't see any mention about Middle East and their cooperation in this speech. No, there was an article in the paper this morning about um, how OPEC said it was not going to open the spigot. Interesting. Okay. There uh, is a big push right now by the oil and gas companies to get Biden to, you remember he froze a lot of the pipelines, he wouldn't let them go forward, to get them to uh, go back to using uh, coal and oil uh, as a, you know, uh, a lot of the environmental groups are concerned that this is going to be used to go against the environment. Right. Um, do you think any of the criticism, either by GOP or otherwise, is well-founded? Because um, we are going to see a, a massive increase in gas prices at the pump. And um, do you think it's warranted for some of the criticism if he doesn't go back to some of these oil supplies? I'm hoping that what's going to happen is it's going to make people turn to renewable, you know, energy sources. I'm hoping that it's going to force people away from oil and gas. It's going to wake them up to see there are other options out there. We don't have to be stuck with these guys paying their, you know, their banks and their CEOs, you know, billions of dollars every year. And so I'm really hoping that people are going to start changing the way they think about oil. Instead of going back to more, I'm hoping that, that Biden just, you know, pushes and pushes and pushes the climate change renewable energy stuff. So I have something funny that I want to share. Since it was a positive speech and all, right? We're doing positive things about it too. Um, <laughs> so last night on Stephen Colbert, um, those nighttime comedy shows are the things that have made me survive Trump and get through all this political nonsense. So, so he says it was inspiring, you know, to see um, such a moving moment. Of, I'm going to read it too, because I want to make sure I get it right. When he says, you know, what, such a moving moment of bipartisan unity um, when he recognized the Ukraine ambassador, um, Oksana uh, Mark and Niova, I'm not getting her name right, sorry. But um, at any rate, he says it was a moving moment to see a bipartisan unity, especially considering that the last time Congress stood up that fast together, they were the ones fleeing 
a fascist invasion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Touche. Oh, how appropriate. <laughs> how appropriate. Thank you for bringing that to our attention, Cynthia, as always. Hey, Jay, um, President Biden uh, touched on the economy. Uh, specifically, he talked about um, you know, the job creation growth that we've had. And uh, he mentioned the Intel opening, uh, uh, plant opening. Uh, I think it was a $20 billion commitment in Ohio. Uh, did he hit the points or did he connect the dots on the economy and um, you know, success there, but uh, its correlation to inflation? Well, you know, it's a priorities thing, right? Um, seems to me that he it's aspirational on, um, on the notion that we should have manufacturing back in this country. And he's talking a lot about that, and that's encouraging. Uh, and I think he can do stuff about that, even you know, even on a proclamation level, and certainly on a rhetoric level, to have entrepreneurs start plants again. And and um, the you know the supply chain problems has uh, accentuated that, um, and inflation has a accentuated that. If we do it in this country, we can sort of tolerate the inflation, and if we get you know careful about the Fed, and we raise uh, the rediscount rate, that will help on the inflation. So uh, I guess the, the point is that, you know, economics with all of these things is an art, not a science. We never have learned how do we exactly control all this, but he's got some smart guys around him uh, and he is attending to it. He is aware of it. He's not, he's not doing stupid things. Uh, he's awake, he's alive. And so that's the message I got that he's working on it and uh, who knows what will happen? We may be in for more inflation, probably will be, and it'll be a struggle to open up plants in this country, but he wants to. And so all of that is right thinking and conceivably he's able to do, you know, make some real you know, progress on both sides of that. Yeah. You know, you made a specific mention. I think this has been going on since Jimmy Carter all the way through all the presidents. And that is the Made in America banner that's, that often is flown in the air uh, to make Americans feel better. We know that made in America, sometimes the engine can be made in, um, in Europe, yet the door handles are made in um, Iowa, yet uh, the, the car now is labeled made in America. Uh, what about that point of made in America? Does that, does that strike a nerve? Uh, does that really, is there a real commitment from well, some, the Biden administration things. to do that? Some things can be, should be made in America. Other things cannot. I mean, I read this morning uh, that we're the largest suppliers of lithium for batteries, right? And, you know, batteries are increasingly important in our world. Um, one of the largest suppliers of lithium is, guess what? I is sitting down Ukraine, Ukraine. Um, so if we lose our relations with Ukraine, and we will, uh, if Putin you know, becomes the dictator there directly or indirectly, uh, we're going we're gonna to have trouble with uh, lithium. We may have trouble with lithium out of other places too, like China so, um, and Africa and Africa. So uh, we have to be mindful of the supply chain things that you mentioned, uh, that, you know, we live in an interdependent world and um, we, we have to, you know, have the geopolitical connections, the foreign policy connections to be sure that we have all this. One of the interesting things is a, a battery component. I want to say it's a, it's the blue material. What is that? Um, manganese uh, was being mined by an American company in, in, the, in the Congo. Um, and uh, they were also in coal in the United States and they were losing money in coal. Um, and the Chinese came around and, and wanted to buy them. And they, they wound up, uh, with, there was an opposition uh, voiced to the American government. Um, and ultimately um, money, money talked and the, the Chinese bought the company. And that was a major supplier of um, you know, important rare earths. Mm -hmm. um, so we could have done better on that. The government has to work with private industry to assure the, that the interdependence works and that we have the supply lines. Otherwise, uh, it, it won't be made in America. No chance it can be made in America. Yes, the components are international, but ultimately we, we can be at the top of the manufacturing chain 
And I think that's what he's talking about. That's what I'm talking about anyway. Okay, thank you. Karen, um, President Biden in his address indirectly acknowledged that uh, there's polarization. Sorry, it was cobalt. Cobalt, yes. Cobalt okay. in the Congo, right. yes. Right, okay, thank you. Uh, Karen, uh, I think he indirectly acknowledged that there's great polarization between the GOP and, and uh, the Democrats per pertaining to his agenda. But he did cite four specific things that he thought should not be, um, a, you know, any kind of uh, debate about, and that all parties should agree that these things should be uh, looked at and and bills passed. And those were the following items: um, the op opioid crisis and support for recovering addicts, funds for mental health, funds for veterans' health care due to uh, toxic burn pits in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the last one was funds to uh, continue the cancer moonshot efforts. Uh, is President Biden correct on that, that, that the GOP will rally around those four topics and, and approve uh, pending legislation? Well, one would think they were non-political topics. They all have to do with everyone's health. But given their past uh, you know, background where they um, politicize every issue, it's hard to say. Particularly, I think uh, there's a mental health crisis in the United States that's not been addressed with all these people on the streets and uh, nowhere for them to go. There's no uh, kind of uh, ability to solve that problem. So I think that it, I think he rightly points out those are critical issues, but I don't know about you know how much the GOP will get on board with them. Okay, uh, do you think that uh, those topics would be? If they're not now, the the opening door, if you will, to uh, further legislation, similar to the Ukraine rally of support and unity. Um, it could be. I mean, one would think they're kind of neutral issues in the sense that they're not uh, politicized as yet. Uh, so um, I guess time will tell because it's hard to know. But one thing I did want to mention uh, to Cynthia's point earlier about the uh, economy. One thing that hasn't been addressed is the Federal Reserve's policy, which is creating the inflation. I don't know if you noticed in Sunday's New York Times, Warren Buffett announced that his company had made $90 billion profit. And the reason they made the profit is they're taking the money that's being given to them by the Federal Reserve, the stimulus money for the banks and the corporations, and they're using it to buy, he said he's planning to use 144 billion of the company's cash to buy back uh, shares of his own stock to drive the prices up. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of thing that is really out of control that people don't aren't aware of that I didn't hear Biden address. And you know, and no normal person gets zero percent interest rates on loans now, but these billionaires are making out like bandits. So, um, I well, think that was certainly the case when the um, the corporate rate cut. There was assumption that capital improvement uh, would be um, purchased by corporations, and and certainly wage increases that uh, they would use as a result of the tax cut. Yet, by and by and large, it went to buying back their own stock and increased compensation for CEOs. Right. You know, and let me add that, uh, you know, you spoke earlier about uh, the abuses over the, you know, federal funding in the crisis. That's peanuts compared to the notion that they're using this money to buy back their own stock. That, that phenomenon has a much greater effect on the national economy. Bingo. Uh, absolutely, Jay. And I'm a little surprised it's Warren Buffett because uh, he's pretty conscientious about not accepting um, certain corporate giveaways. And he certainly was one to uh, spout off about the fact that uh, taxes do need to increase. The corporate tax rate and, and, and personal uh, tax rates need to be increased uh, for the uh, 1%. So I'm, I'm a little surprised that his name came up on that. Yeah. Well, he was proud of this uh, buyback of stocks. So not only did they come up, but he was treating it as a uh, plus for his company. Mm -hmm. Well. <laughs> <laughs> that means there's going to be a lot of uh, happy executives. What can I say? <laughs> All right. Uh, we're almost out of time. Cynthia, you're, you get the last question on this topic. And that is, uh, what was your assessment of the, of the, the address? Give it, a, give it a rating. Give it a score. Um, I am with Karen. I gave it an A. I also was like Karen kind of going, okay, well, uh, I was worried. 
I'm, I was really worried because I thought, what if he blows it? Oh my God. <laughs> So I like threw out the thing. I sort of white knuckling my chair going, oh, please don't blow it. Just don't blow it. Just don't blow it. And then, you know, about halfway, I started to really lighten up. And once I saw him look over at the Republicans and say, and some of you have already gone back to your states and touted this, you know, stuff. And so I thought, oh, OK, maybe he's going to be all right. And by the end, I was really encouraged and I thought he did it a great job. And I started thinking about a couple of Trump's, um, you know, State of the Union addresses when he was in office. And I just thought, I hope, every, I mean, every single person in that, in Congress sitting there, right, must have been struck by the difference especially the ones that have been there long enough to know what presidents were like before Trump and then during and now after. And they're seeing this, you know, resurgence of integrity and honor, you know, that's coming back. And does that infect the American public? I think so. I do. I, I, I know I don't know about the Republicans because I watched the Republican response. So, you know, the Republicans watched that part and she just lied and and said a bunch of stuff that wasn't even true about Biden and and the things that he said during the speech that I watched the speech. He didn't say them. And it's um, and she's the same one, you know, like I said, who is in trouble right. for funds. So, All righty. So, but I want to finish with a really beautiful story about Ukraine, if it's OK. Um, By all means. Uh, there is a picture they found, they caught it on film and I watched, it's so beautiful. This Ukrainian grandmother is out there and you can tell she's older, she's kind of stooped, you know, and she's just cussing out this Russian soldier. And I mean, she is giving him what for. And when she's done, she hands him a bunch of seeds and tells him to put them in his pocket. And then she tells them that they are sunflower seeds and she can't wait to watch the sunflowers bloom from his dead corpse after he falls dead on the ground in Ukraine. And I thought, you go, Grandma. That well, was powerful. You know, it's said that you don't mess with Ukrainians. That's, um, that's, an, old, that's an old saying and I'd have to concur. All right, Cynthia, thank you. We, uh, we're gonna go around the corner here, around the table very quickly and get last thoughts. Jay, to you, last thought. Well, um, it's, you know, uh, over the years, uh, State of the Union messages have become theater. And there was a certain amount of theater. The young boy, for example, with diabetes and drug prices, and it was his birthday. That was true theater. Uh, to a certain extent, the Ukrainian ambassador was theater. Um, but on the other hand, people watch it just as they watch television in general. A lot of people watched it. It had an effect, I would say, on, on balance. It had a, a positive effect. I wouldn't give it an A, but I would give it over a B, uh, maybe even a B plus uh, in terms of the effect, not only on the American people and to some very limited extent, maybe on Republicans going forward. You know, the, the, pr the price of bipartisanship, the benefits of bipartisanship are are obvious, and he made that clear. Um, and then, of course, the world. And I think that's the most important point of all. He was speaking to the world. He was speaking of America, the, the city on the hill, America, you know, the moral beacon. Uh, we're back sort of thing. And uh, he never, men never mentioned Trump's name once. And so I think the people in Europe were probably encouraged by what he said, by the gentlemanliness and the kindness and, you know, the morality of it. So I think he did as good a job as he could have done in the circumstances. But we can never forget that we have a divided country and it's been going down the side for all the years of Trump. Uh, if not before, but especially during the years of Trump. And so while we see um, the tipping point in Europe, which could go either way, uh, regrettably, um, we would be in so much better shape to be able to focus on that and deal with that as the one primary issue and not have to deal with the, with the nonsense that goes on in government and in, in the political divide. So all in all, um, I'm encouraged, but it's not 
that it's not a sweeping encouragement because I know at the end of the day, we'll have to face the same problems we had to face the day before. All right, Jay, thank you. Karen, your last thoughts? Well, I think that uh, heretofore he's sort of seen the presidency as an ensemble act by including all the different factions in the Democratic Party under his tent. But maybe this suggests that he needs to step out more and uh, you know show what he can do because I think he really can rally the troops uh, if he appears in the press a little more and shows that he's a leader that has the uh, morality and the sense of honor that the previous president did not. Good point. Thank you. Uh, Cynthia, we've out of time or over time, but your last thought. Um, I'm still going to be promoting um, Ukraine right now, and I'm going to quickly give you two super short quotes. One, this one is from President Zelensky. To the world, what is the point of saying never again for 80 years if the world stays silent when a bomb drops on the same site of Babin Yar, at least five killed, history repeating itself? And his wife, this is, I love this quote, it's so beautiful. Her name is Olena Zelensky, and she with her husband have both refused asylum in the United States. And she says, Jay, your disco uh, Hi, ring Jay. Is... <laughs> Go ahead, Cynthia, keep going. So at any rate, she says, I will not panic and cry. I will be calm and confident. My children are watching me. I will be next to them and next to my husband and with you. I love you. I love you, Ukraine. All righty. Thank you for ending with that. I'd like to thank our guests for this very, very important topic. And I'd like to thank Jay Fidel, Karen Buzzard, and Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Thank you for joining us on What Now America. Join us next Wednesday at 11 o'clock. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And we hope to see you then. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.